and welcome to another edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast, a podcast that is committed to bringing the most, well, the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet directly to your earbuds. And and today is another, I, I say this every single time, so I probably shouldn't say it again, but I will. I, I'm so excited about the podcast today. In fact, the author of the book that is in view on the podcast today uh, is not only a terrific person, but a terrific writer. And, 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 and I was showing her just before the podcast that her book is falling apart because I've read it so many times. But I think that's part of the process. You know, when you get this book, and I highly recommend that you do, the podcast is on a book titled Scripture and Tradition, What the Bible Really Says. Don't read it once. Don't read it twice. Read it at least three times. Um, C.S. Lewis often advised us that if you want to be lettered in reading, read something three times. And I find that to be true over and over again. So I usually start with perusing a book, then I read it with a yellow marker, and then I read it with a pen tell. And on each reading, I start to take the content of the book uh, from, from, from something I read to something that I own. So I highly recommend this book, Scripture and Tradition, What the Bible Really Says. And, and, and I recommend it for a lot of reasons. This is one of the seminal points of divergence between Anglicans, Roman Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox. And we're going to talk about all of that and more, but I should probably get to introducing my guest. Her name is Edith Humphrey. She's a PhD. She's a professor emerita of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, a great seminary in a great city. Uh, she is retired now. I don't know why, because when you talk to her, you can't imagine her being retired. She's the grandmother of 22 kids. Now, I have 14, no, going on 15 grandchildren. She has 22 grandchildren. Uh, she's an author. She's written a number of very significant books. Again, the book that is in view for this podcast is Scripture and Tradition, What the Bible Really Says. She grew up in the Salvation Army. She was nurtured in the Protestant tradition. She then moved into Catholic and a historic understanding of the church coming by way of Anglicanism into the Eastern Orthodox Church. So this project really came about in a very interesting way. Her husband, Chris, encouraged her to write this book, and then she had a sleepless night, and I guess that sealed the deal. Uh, again, the subject matter is transcendently important. Jarosław Pelikan, one of the quotes I memorized a long time ago, said that tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And so a, a lot of people confuse tradition with traditionalism. The ism is the problem. Uh, I love what this line in Fiddler of the Roof says, without our traditions, our lives would be as shaky as a fiddler on the roof. So with that, by way of introduction, Edith, I, I, again, thank you so much for being on the podcast, for writing this book. And I, I want to ask you why uh, the issue of tradition and its relationship to Scripture is so transcendently important. Well, that's a big question. Um, it's really good to be with you, Hank, and uh, and um, I'm, I'm really glad to meet uh, those of you who will be watching this. Today's featured resource on the Hank Unplugged podcast is Scripture and Tradition, What the Bible Really Says, by prominent New Testament scholar Edith M. Humphrey. To learn more about this resource, please hit the I in the upper right-hand corner. Um, tradition is important because it was especially in the West, it's important for us to grapple with because this was one of the sticking issues um, at the time of the Reformation uh, between Protestants and Catholics. Um, uh, Protestants held on to the assertion of Martin Luther that we should uh, cleave to those things that are taught by Scripture alone, whereas 
um, in the uh, Catholic um, community, there was an insistence that scripture must be understood in terms of the light of the traditions of the church, and that um, truth was to be found. This actually didn't get into uh, the declarations of the church, but it was much, uh, much used language that was much used at the time. Uh, truth is to be found partly in scripture and partly in tradition. And so you had this, um, this collision course between the reformers who were very worried about traditions that seemed to be taking away from the integrity of the gospel and from the honor of Christ. And those who remained in Catholicism who said, but you you cannot really understand the scriptures unless you read them in terms of the tradition. And in fact, there were things in the tradition that you need in order to uh, in order to be one with God. So you have this uh, this conflict going on, and we've inherited that today. Uh, when Christians talk with Christians, they often don't understand what the other person means by tradition or what, say, a Protestant means by scripture alone. And so we have to come to terms with each other to understand it, but also to think in terms of what is the relationship between scripture and tradition. I think we're illiterate with respect to both the scriptures today and tradition, speaking in a very general sense. And you make that point with respect to scripture by uh, evoking the memory of the Battle of Dunkirk uh, in 1940. Uh, three words that would have meant so much to the British population in that epoch of time, which have very little meaning to us today, uh, if we don't know our Bibles, but if not, those three words. Mm -hmm. Comment on that, if so, you will. So I'm a little unnerved having learned um, and passed on that tradition about Dunkirk that we don't actually have any historical evidence for it being true. Nevertheless, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't have oh, any hilarious. to it prior to the early 70s, actually. And it seems to be a story that just came um, and grabbed people. So I'll tell you the story, whether it's true or not, it makes an important point. And yes. the story is that um, one of the leaders who'd been sent um, uh, had been, been sent into battle um, and against all odds, sent back to home office a telegram with the three words, but if not in it. And um, the, uh, the impression one gets from the story is that the one who sent the telegram assumed that those, the one who received it and those who heard it would understand his point. And the reason why that would have been possible is because back in the time of the Second World War, people knew their scriptures and they would have recognized those three poignant words from one of the, the stories of Daniel in which um, the, uh, the young man um, who are told that they have to uh, bow down before the idol, say to the, um, the despot who's making them do this, um, know, O king, that we will not bow down before the idol. And in fact, our God is able to deliver us. But if not, we will still be faithful. And so the point that the, um, the leader who was being sent off into battle was trying to make is even if that this is not successful, um, I will remain faithful and I will do what you've asked me to do. And then the story goes that as a result of that telegram, which was broadcast and told to people um, across the radios, um, there was a, an outpouring of, of um, support and um, help. And that was the beginning of Operation Dynamo when just ordinary people, as well as those who were had, had more means, sent their vessels across to try to um, bring people off the French coast and home. So you that is the story. Yeah, and you use that in your in your classes from time to time, mm -hmm. uh, and, and every now and then there's a couple of outliers that understand exactly what that means. But by and large, people have grown to be biblically illiterate, and I've certainly experienced that in over 40 years of doing the Bible Instrument broadcast. But um, I, I want to get to this whole issue of sola scriptura, that the Bible is the infallible rule for faith and practice. I think it's ironic that there are so many people that hold to the phrase, but yet are not particularly conversant 
with the fact that they hold to many dogmas that don't find their basis in Scripture. For example, dispensationalism or the Augustinian doctrine of original sin or the denial of free will, the health and the wealth gospel, and the the examples go on and on. Mm-hmm. And well, in my own experience, I'm, I'm very grateful for um, the piety and the love that was shown to me as I was brought up in the Salvation Army. I'm actually a fourth generation Salvationist. My uh, grandfather was one of the little boys that was taken in Scotland into the mines to get the coal in the uh, areas that the larger people couldn't go. And, I, and I'm and i very grateful to what the Salvation Army brought to my family so that, um, that both in terms of um, lifestyle and in terms of faith, um, my family could, uh, uh, could could have been elevated and could have been helped. So I'm very grateful, and I'm grateful for what I learned. But one of the things that troubled me as even a teenager was, we said that we believed in sola scriptura. One of our doctrines is, uh, we believe that the scriptures of the Old and New Testament are given by inspiration of God, and they only constitute the divine rule of Christian faith and practice. I had to memorize that along with other tenets of faith. By the way, not exactly in scripture, but there's a lot of quotations from scripture there. And yet the Salvation Army did not baptize and did not practice uh, the Lord's Supper or Eucharist or communion. And I, I found that very strange since Christ commanded both, one at the end of Matthew's gospel and the other in several of uh, of the other gospels. So um, I had started thinking very early about that and was also intrigued by the fact that in my home uh, community, the Salvation Army had its own traditions that were held to and they were seen to be helpful. The wearing of uniforms, the swearing in of soldiers under the flag, uh, the coming to the mercy seat at the front as an act of repentance. The whole form of our service took a traditional form and people know what a Salvation Army service or meeting looks like. So all of those things were small t traditions. I wanted to know then what place should tradition have? If we acknowledge that all of us have traditions, what place should tradition have in the Christian Christian lifestyle and in in Christian belief? And does it help if we acknowledge up front that all of us follow traditions, which in fact we all do, whether we say sola scriptura or not? Well, what is the difference between sola scriptura and prima scriptura? Okay, so um, many of the fathers make very strong claims for the importance of the scriptures. For example, St. John Chrysostom says that all the heresies come from not knowing the scriptures and that the scriptures are full of riches and, um, and instruction for everyone at every stage of their development. There's a very strong emphasis upon scripture, for example, then in St. John Chrysostom and in some of the other church fathers as well. Um, I think that you could demonstrate from quotations from St. John Chrysostom that he held to what we would call a prima scriptura um, principle. That is, scripture is the solid core of all that has been given to us, all that has been given over to us, that is old tradition. It is that um, that anchor and that, um, that crystallization of the whole life that we've been given. But the other things are constellations around it and help us to understand um, what it says and help us to apply it. So, for example, there's nowhere in Scripture that says that I should have a quiet time with the Lord every morning. It doesn't specify that. But that would be a tradition that helps to clarify what, in fact, the Scripture does say over and over again, that we should meditate upon the Lord and come into his presence with thanksgiving and with our petitions as well. So Prima Scriptura would say Scripture is the solid core of everything that's been given, of all the holy tradition that's been given to us, Uh, whereas Sola Scriptura would say um, you only look to Scripture for something that is normative, and anything else can be put aside. It's a matter of the waiting. 
Yeah, that, 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 that's well explained. Uh, one of the things I want to get into a little bit is the distinction between Roman Catholics and Orthodox mm-hmm. when it comes to uh, a tradition. So we used to say that the Catholics ride two horses, scripture and tradition. But I've read many people in the Orthodox world, like uh, Metropolitan Callistus Ware of Blessed Memory, who 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 said that Scripture is not an independent instance. It's not a complementary source of faith, but it's a right way of understanding the faith. So with that as prologue, give us a little distinction here between the East and the West on, 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 on the subject of tradition. Yeah, I think we have to be really careful that we don't caricature um, uh, mm. those, uh, those who are outside of our community. And I would say that um, Roman Catholicism probably is not monolithic or um, has only one view of the relationship between scripture and tradition. But the most common one that we hear is that there is scripture and there is tradition, and that both of these are authorities for the Christian and for the church in making decisions for today um, or in, uh, in de- determining what it is that we should believe. And you can see, um, certainly, uh, as an Orthodox, I can see some point to that. For example, when I go to the New Testament, I have to work very hard, though I believe I can do it, in order to yield the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. It can be done. It was done by the Church Fathers, but one has to take a section here, a section here, a section here, and put them together. So, for example, we don't have... And um, even in the New Testament, any um, any instruction that we're to pray to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one by whom we pray, but can we address prayers to him? And as, uh, as Orthodox, we would say, well, of course we can. He is God and he's a person. And what else do you do but uh, pray to a divine person? But um, the, the actual full-blown doctrine of the Holy Spirit only comes to us through the creeds, and um, through the work of the fathers subsequent to after the New Testament. Now, of course, they were getting their raw material from the scriptures. They didn't just invent this out of whole cloth, but they have shone, you say shone, don't you? I'm a Canadian still. <laughs> they have shown a light upon, um, upon those parts of scripture and show how to integrate them so that we understand the full doctrine of the Trinity. So getting back then to Catholics and Orthodox, I can see why they would say, you need the creeds, you need the scriptures. Uh, but it, uh, and then, and then there are other ways that some Catholics have uh, talked about tradition too. Some have talked about tradition as a kind of a developing thing that there are new um, doctrines that can be um, discerned as the church grows through the ages. And I think that as Orthodox, that might be the the place where we have a real sticking point uh, with this idea of there being two authorities because there are certainly some Marian doctrines in Roman Catholicism that have been only articulated formally in the last, say, couple of hundred years. And um, we would see those as a departure from the tradition. They would see that as an evolution. So um, I think that um, we... Uh, Orthodox have not articulated in a um, decree or in teaching what is the relationship between tradition and scripture. But I think that if you look at the church fathers as a whole, we come to the consensus that scripture and tradition are intertwined and it's very hard to divide one from the other, but that scripture is the solid center of the whole church life. Whereas frequently Roman Catholics speak about these things as though they are separate entities. Uh, Vladimir yeah, I, Lofsky, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Well, Vladimir I, I Lofsky love- had, had a very interesting point when he talked about tradition being the, um, uh, being related to the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the church. And I think that's pretty accurate because actually before we have the Gospels, we have the traditions about Jesus. 
right? And then after the Gospels, we have the traditions about how to worship Jesus. And so there's a uh, there's a movement of the Holy Spirit from before the writing of the Gospels into the writing of the Gospels and beyond that, that enlivens the church. So I have this brilliant professor on the podcast today, and 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 I think I want to take this opportunity for you to to give us an understanding of the early church, because it seems to me in talking to many, many people over a long period of time, and I don't want to make the mistake of caricature as you uh, admonished earlier, I, I think that's a very smart point to make, but I speak to so many people that have little concept of the early church uh, that that seem to think that somehow or other, after Jesus and the apostles, everything went dark mm. until maybe the Reformation or even subsequent to the Reformation. So, so give us a little idea of how tradition gives us the Bible, how tradition gives us a proper understanding of Christology or Trinitarian theology, as, as you alluded to earlier. I, I, I think for people to get some kind of a, an idea of how the faith is transitioned from Jesus and the apostles to the apostolic fathers to the, uh, the, the, the great apologists in the early centuries of the church, then to the pre and the post Nicene fathers and so forth. I think it's helpful for them to get just kind of a, maybe a rough sketch of that. Okay. Well, um, the, Christian movement comes up about the same time as what would come to be Judaism, such as we know it today. There is the Hebrew, uh, all the different Hebrew sects that come up until this point. And once you get to the time, say, of Jesus and of St. Paul, there are four well-known Jewish sects, but there are others as well. You know, there, there are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, there are um, the Zealots. And then there are the Samaritans. And beyond that, there are also just ordinary Jewish people called the people of the land, and there are the mystical rabbis. So um, Judaism survives the fall of the temple through the Pharisaic movement, because the Pharisees were able to make the Hebrew faith portable. They, they, um, they, um put in the center of their faith the Torah and rather than the temple. And the Torah could be read, could be taken in scrolls, could be um, could be venerated, could be understood in the synagogues, not just in the temple. So once the temple fell, that a uh, form of Judaism that centered itself around the Torah had a chance to survive, and it did, and it became the Judaism uh, that we know today in all its various forms. About the same time, people who heard Jesus preach and who listened to his apostles and who heard the 70 go into all the towns and villages and who heard the, the disciples of the disciples give the story about Jesus in various Gentile, um, non-Jewish contexts, um, they formed a kind of um, counter movement in which not the Torah was the center, not the scriptures, but Jesus, the person. Now, the scriptures still remain really important. Jesus read uh, the Old Testament. The apostles read the Old Testament. And by the way, the one that was most um, read back there then would have been an old Greek version, which we uh, simplistically call the Septuagint. But that's the version that was used certainly by most of the writers of the New Testament. Um, but the difference between Judaism and Christianity was their center. And although we love the scriptures and we hear about the stories that point forward to Jesus in the Old Testament, and we hear about the stories about Jesus in the New Testament, the center of our faith isn't a book like with the Jewish people. It is a person, the Lord Jesus. So by the time you get to the second century, the late first, early second century, you even have um, people like um, Bishop Papias, 
or Papias, people have different pronunciations, saying that he preferred to actually listen to the disciples of the disciples when they came around preaching than to just look at a book because they were, um, it was person to person, it was lively. I think we often think, oh, the New Testament was written and then they all simply just read the New Testament and they continued replicating little churches on their own. Whereas, in fact, when we get when we uh, when we look at how people spoke and how people worshipped in the early second century in the sub apostolic period, they already are they are they still are hearkening back to the words that Jesus told the apostles and that the apostles told their their disciples, and there is a li- a living um, a living tradition that continues. For example, baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is talked about in Matthew, but not three immersions. And three immersions was continued through the church and in and in orthodoxy right up to today. For example, and we don't have in the New Testament, as I mentioned before, reference to prayers to the Holy Spirit, but we know uh, because of the very ancient hymn called Phos Hilarion, O Blessed or O Happy Light, that the Holy Spirit was in fact prayed to and was honored very, very early in the church's tradition. So you have this time before the New Testament was actually, um, its limits were established, where people listened to the reading of the scrolls that were carried from church to church and that were replicated, but they also listened to the living word of the disciples of the apostles or the disciples of the 70 who'd been sent out. And that was considered to be very important because the Holy Spirit works from person to person, not just from book to person. Um, you know, this and, is... Yeah. The- Oh, yeah, I, th- this is just a little insertion here, but uh, mm-hmm. you just tripped my mind to something that you write about in the book, and and, and, and you say that you like to make pies, uh, you, you, you like to bake, um, you, you talk about piano lessons, and, 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 and then you, you elaborate on how these are learned in a three-dimensional fashion as opposed to simply just looking something uh, that in compasses ink on paper. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the Protestant impulse is to think Christianity is a system. If I get the system right, and if I pray the way that I'm taught, and I read and believe the way that I'm taught, then people who have a like mind, like me, can join together and can create a church, and we can be a body. And... um That's rather, in my view, like um, having a flower that's been cut off the plant and put in a vase. And it's got water, and if you feed it, it has some nourishment, but it's not going to propagate. It's not going to be everything that the plant is supposed to be, even if you could keep it alive indefinitely, which is unlikely. I think that um, the the way that the scriptures speak about um, the church, uh, for example, take... Uh, St. Paul in Romans um, uh, 9 through 11, it's more like, a, or even um, Jesus in uh, in the latter part of John's gospel, it's more like a vine or a plant that grows. And it's a natural organic growth, and it grows through persons. Our triune God is personal. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's where the source of life is. So it's not just a matter of an ism. It's a matter of us knowing the creator of all. And he delights in using people to pass on the truth. And to pass on not just the truth, but also a whole way of living and a whole way of being together. So you say in the book, and I'm sorry, I cut you off earlier because you're Uh, just explaining something I think is so important for people to understand. But you say in the book that we are uh, people of Christ as opposed to, uh, maybe this is the wrong word, but I use the word, merely people of the book. I don't Mm -hmm. want to uh, suggest that the book is mere in any sense, but um, that we are people of the Christ as opposed to people of the book. Make make that distinction for So the idea of people of the book is actually a Muslim idea. It's the it's the term that Muhammad used and he said that that we can be more clement 
um, to the Jewish people and the Christian people because they too are people of the book. And if by that you mean that we have a deep respect for the scriptures, I'm all for it. But if by that you mean we are defined primarily by a book, that's a problem because um, as St. Paul says, the letter kills and the spirit gives life. Second Corinthians chapter three. Our life comes from God. Our life comes within the context of a community of those who have known God. Um, as um, as the elder John says in his epistle, you know, um, this the light shone and shone. There we go again. And um, and um, we are telling you this that our joy may be full. Be part of our communion. So it's not simply a matter, and, and this is what I was trying to say, of having an intellectual idea of what it, the truth is, though that is important. It's not just a matter of knowing what the history of Israel is and the history of the apostles is, though that's important. It's not just a matter of knowing how do we think about sexuality and how do we think about idolatry, though those things are important. It's a matter of coming to know God, not just know about him. And that only can be done perfectly personally. And God delights amazingly to use human persons in order to bring us there. Um, so, for example, St. Paul on um, the road to Damascus is stopped and has an immediate vision of um, Christ speaking to him. He sees the light, he hears a voice, he's told um, what are you doing, Saul? It's hard for you to kick against the, pr uh, the, the pricks. And then when he asks, what uh, should I do? He's told, you get yourself to Damascus, to those people that you were going to persecute. And there's someone there waiting to talk to you. And when he gets there, Ananias is the one who personally gives to Paul what he needs, Saul, Paul, what he needs in order to become a Christian. And he is baptized. Now, our almighty God could have told, Jesus could have told Paul everything on the road to Damascus, but he delights to use people. Same thing, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading in the chariot. Holy Spirit could have told him, that's referring to a man called Jesus and given him a vision, but that's not what happens. He whisks um, Philip, the deacon, into the chariot in a miraculous way and Philip teaches the Ethiopian eunuch the way to Christ. So we're a personal faith because the center of our faith is a person and because our God is tri-personal. Yes, and I, I think going back to what you were elaborating on before with respect to the, uh, the development of the early church, um, uh, many, many people would be helped, I think, if you explain how the church gave us the Bible, how the church, according to St. Paul, is the ground and pillar of, tr uh, of truth. So the, the sequence is the church passes on what is believed everywhere, always, and by all. It gives us the Bible, really codified 27 books by uh, a festal letter in, what was it, 367. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and then it, it, it doesn't really become an established corpus for a long time after that, meaning where it's uniformly used all over. Over the Christian world. So the, 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 in, in essence, the question is, the church gives us the Bible, elaborate on that, that seminal truth. So the Bible is there as a kind of written icon to show us who Jesus is. Um, people look, this may be uh, difficult for some who are in Protestant circles, but people look at religious paintings or at icons in order to get truth about who Christ is and who the apostles are. Um, the scriptures themselves are even more detailed and fill in various, um, uh, various um, contours and colors and give us actually 
different ways of looking at who Jesus is. If we put Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John together, it's very hard to make a complete harmony, but we get a well-rounded picture of Jesus that we would never have got if we only had one of them. So, yes, Athanasius is the one who, in his festal letter, first enumerates the books that we consider to be in the New Testament. Um, and um, eventually those come to be accepted by the whole church east and west, although the book of Revelation had some difficulty of acceptance in the east, probably because there was some fear that it would be misunderstood and misinterpreted, as it certainly is today in our own context. Um, actually, the Old Testament never was formally um, delineated um, until you get to a, the Catholic community in the Council of Trent. So we have a different enumeration of the Old Testament books um, in various parts of the church. And that's not so very serious because the purpose of the Old Testament is not to give dogma in itself, but to point forward to Christ. Whenever we're deriving doctrine from the Old Testament, we have to, we have to, um, we have to see those Old Testament texts in the light of the New Testament. So, for example, we have the doctrine of creation out of nothing, formally articulated by Paul in Romans. We also have it articulated by the mother of the martyrs in one of the books of the Maccabees, but not everyone accepts that as, as scripture. We have it implicitly suggested in Genesis 1, but those of you who studied will know that there are some scholars who say that creation out of nothing is not clearly taught in Genesis 1. We have to go then to the New Testament to get that particular understanding of creation that God didn't form stuff uh, that he he didn't coexist with st other stuff that was eternal, but that he alone was the eternal one and that he spoke the wor world into being whatever method he used. So um, the before there was a formal, um, articulation, a formal canonization, we can use that term, of those books that corresponded to what we call the canon of truth. Christians knew what the canon of truth was. It was passed on to them verbally. They had a kind of creed that they spoke. They had a way that they worked together. They had a way that they prayed. Um, and this this um, rule of faith that Paul talks about at the end of um, Galatians was very strong. And we hear Irenaeus talking about that. And he said, even a complete illiterate, a woman who's never learned how to read an older woman, will know when she hears the fables of the Gnostic movement, one of the Gnostic um, uh, uh, churches, she will know that's not the master speaking because she knows the rule of faith and she's been immersed in the church. So the scriptures are really helpful to make solid that rule of faith. But they had that rule of faith before the books were actually collected together into one volume. And um, we continue to have that rule of faith. Today's featured resource on the Hank Unplugged podcast is Scripture and Tradition, What the Bible Really Says by prominent New Testament scholar Edith M. Humphrey. To learn more about this resource, please hit the I in the upper right-hand corner. So when you use the word canon, you're not just using that word to identify what is written. No, no. Um, G uh, uh, Paul, again, um, at the end of Galatians, says, peace be on those who walk by this rule. And he uses the word canon there. And he's not talking about um, a group of books. I mean, we even, you know, since, say, Harold Bloom, we even use the word canon to talk about classical books that are accepted by everybody, that here's a list that everybody has to read. It's come to mean a list of books that are, uh, are considered to be authoritative. What it means is a rule of any sort, and for Christians, what it means is a rule of life and a rule of belief and a rule of how to be. And that includes accepting the scriptures that the, the, the church has um, declared correspond to that rule. But there were books in the second century that early Christians read that were helpful for them that did not make it into the canon, such as we call it today. Why? because there were things that were disturbing and not quite right in them. 
For example, one of them uh, questions the idea that God actually gave a historical rule to the Jewish people not to eat food that was not kosher. And it, it um, bypasses the historical way that God worked. Um, another one of them suggests that there can't be repentance if you sin after baptism. And so these books did not make it into the actual canon, though they are well, they were well read in the second century and can help us today, um, just as any book can in our piety. So the canon is the whole, um, the whole measure which is what the word means, of what it is to be a Christian and to be Christians together in the church. And it includes now for us these books that we have between two covers. But the church is the one that discerned that those books are the ones that should be read normatively by Christians. Yes, so you say the books that we have between two covers. Um, maybe that bears a little elaboration because as you alluded to earlier, the Orthodox Bible in terms of the Old Testament is very different uh, in terms of the number of books than the Protestant Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the Protestant Bibles typically use the Masoretic or Palestinian text for the Old Testament, whereas the Orthodox Bible uses a Septuagint. Mm -hmm. And therefore you have coherence between passages that are quoted in the New Testament which are Old Testament passages and the Old Testament passages themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes there's a disjuncture between the quote of the Old Testament passage in a, a, in a Protestant Bible and the actual passage itself in the Old Testament. So you got a couple of questions there. One, the number of books and the other, uh, the, the, the source, Masoretic or Palestinian versus Septuagint. Right. Okay, um, the number of books, as I as I did mention before, um, in the New Testament, there's no question. Um, uh, there there may be a few passages that um, that are uh, uh, debated. So, for example, the story of the woman caught in adultery in John's Gospel floated around in other Gospels and found its place in John's gospel, and probably it wasn't there originally, but it is an authentic Jesus story, and most people accept it as such. Um, at the end of the, uh, the first epistle of John, there is a passage that speaks specifically of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which most scholars don't think was in the original, but was added later as a kind of an interpretation. An, inter an interpretation. So there are, uh, or the the end, for example, of Mark's gospel is not in the earliest manuscripts that we have. So there there are a few differences, though minor, in the New Testament. As far as the Old Testament is concerned, um. Even Orthodox differ a little bit from group to group about which which books are read. I think that it's helpful to think in terms of how the fathers described the books. They spoke about the Old Testament. Um, they spoke about the New Testament, and they also spoke about the readable books. And those would be the extra books of the Old Testament um, that, that Protestants used to actually have in a separate section between the Old and the New uh, Testament. But eventually, of course, for, for the, the sake of brevity, it, it dropped out. And the, the shame about losing those books is that, from my perspective, many of them have a family or a um a woman, um, a heroine, um, a focus in them. And I think that dropping them out has actually made Christianity appear to be far more um, uh, centered upon just men than actually was the case. Um, there certainly is, there certainly is an order in the family. That Christianity um, ad, ad, accepts along, uh, classical Christianity would accept along with uh, Judaism, but we miss without without the um, the books of the um, of the deuterocanonical or the readable or what what um, Protestants call the apocrypha. We're missing stories of Judith and Susanna and the marriage of Tobias and Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, we're missing 
um, delightful scenes where husband and wife pray together, where a woman calls out and is vindicated and answered by God. Um, we're, we're missing the long passages in Wisdom of Solomon, where wisdom, wisdom is described in feminine terms, and that helps us to understand some of how the Holy Spirit, whom I still call he, because Jesus did, but how some of the Holy Spirit is in um, imminent and within us. We're missing that um, that familial and mystical quality um, that those books uh, add to the faith. So I think that's a shame. Um, on the other hand, all of the Old Testament books, their purpose is to point to Christ. And so it's not terribly um, serious if we have a disagreement with regards to the extent of them, because even with the limited canon, we get the pointing forward to Christ. So that's, that's you know, in terms of the extent, that's the first thing. I just think we're missing some wonderful um, examples of piety and, um, and of, of courage and of depth if we miss those books. Uh, and I think that I think that the early reformers even would say that those who had who didn't believe that these books were canonical, they believed that they should be read. Secondly, in terms of the distinction between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint, um, when we look at the New Testament, it's true that many of the quotations, I would say the majority of them, seem to be based on something like this, the Septuagint. And it's difficult to talk about the Septuagint anyway, because there were several different Greek mm -hmm. versions. But they don't seem at certain points to be as close to the Masoretic text, that is the Hebrew text, such as it was preserved in the early medieval period by the Jews. It's a mistake to think that um, Protestant Bibles are based upon the early Hebrew version and Orthodox Bibles are based on a later Septuagint <laughs> version. Both are based on later versions. We don't have access to the early Hebrew version except sometimes through, through the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we are discovering some very interesting things. For example, we're discovering that in some readings, the Septuagint version appears to be closer to some of the Hebrew um, texts as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls than the Masoretic text. So it's complex. And as a, as a, as a scholar, I want to be able to read both the Hebrew, such as we have it, and the Septuagint, and where I can, where somebody will help me, I'd like to see what the old Hebrew version has to say in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. Uh, and this does this this makes a difference in nuance, and it does make a difference, as you suggest, in matching. So, for example, the obvious one is the virgin shall conceive in Isaiah, um, uh, with Parthenos over against Alma. Alma simply means a young woman, whether she has been married or not. And um, uh, we don't have any um, disjuncture between the the quotation in this in the Gospels and the Septuagint version, which uses the same word, such as you would have um, two different words um, if you're using the Hebrew text. So that would be the obvious thing. But I, I, I think we don't need to be doctrinaire about this, frankly. I think the Holy Spirit can navigate and can work through different translations, whether it's English, whether it's Hebrew, whether it's Greek, and that what needs to be learned by the church will be learned even in a version that is problematic. So um, we want, obviously, to have the best, uh, the best text that we possibly can in order to understand that God is not limited by our mistakes in translation. Hmm. And I'm very thankful for that. I want to talk about tradition with respect to hot button issues. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the ordination of women. Mm -hmm. uh, so recently I was reading an article about um, Rick Warren, who's a megachurch pastor. I've spoken in his church. Um, I consider him a friend. But he left the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, one of the issues that was involved was the ordination of women. Um, his argumentation is essentially that well, in Ephesians 4.11, uh, the word pastors is used, but you can't really find that, that word. I'm sort of summarizing his argument, but you can't find that word 
in the Bible. So you really can't tell whether it's a male or a female. Um, and, 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 and therefore, uh, he's ordaining uh, women now and saying that he has sinned against the church by not ordaining women previously. And I think vicariously what that says, even though he may not intend this, it says that the whole church has been sinning against women by not ordaining them throughout the history of the church. So that's a hot button issue, uh, certainly right now. But holy tradition has so much to say about women. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, in, in such a poignant and positive sense, um, and, 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 and so it's not demeaning at all not to ordain women. You, you, you don't have to look at the Scripture. Holy tradition gives us a sense, just as you point out, of the majesty of a woman uh, in every sense, ontologically equal, different roles, and so forth. But the, yeah, and I mean, I say this oftentimes, I mean, in orthodoxy, I mean, our exemplar for theosis is a woman. Um, you know, she's everything we hope to be. She's the quintessence of, of, of theosis or deification. So, uh, again, to get to the hot button issue of the ordination of women, it's so important to have a good sense of holy tradition. Yeah, I think that's right. And and not just do's and don'ts holy tradition, but the fullness of holy tradition that actually uh, esteems and um, uh, and is moved by the stories of women as well as of men. Um I mean, I think that it's very difficult to have a conversation between Orthodox on the one hand and Protestants on the other about ordination in 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 general, let alone the ordination of women. Because what we understand by the priesthood is not what they understand by pastors. So when I became Orthodox, the only question, or one, no, there were a couple, there were two or three questions, but they were all of this nature. That One of the major questions that was asked when I became Orthodox and I was teaching at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary is, well, how can you possibly uh, prepare women for ministry since your church doesn't accept this? And I looked at them and I said, certainly we accept that women can minister. There are all kinds of examples of women ministering. The question is, do you believe in priests? And I and I come from the Anglican communion that that that, that believed in um, in the priesthood. Um, at least some um, some do in the same way that um, Orthodox would as, as as a particular ordination or charism that's given. But I said the first conversation that has to be have, had is. What is a priest? And is there a continuation of the priesthood into the new covenant? You would say not, right? And so I have no trouble preparing women to read the scriptures and to talk to people about the scriptures and to help people practically in ministry as, as a deacon would. I have no difficulty whatsoever. The question you really want to ask is, do you what do you think the priest a priest is, right? And I actually think that... Um, um, Paul Evdokimov, who hasn't written a good deal and not all of it was finished or and not all of it has been translated, but I think he has a very good instinct here where he suggests that the woman's charism is prophetic, whereas the man's charism is more priestly. And he aligns women uh, in terms of, of the Trinity more with the operations of the Holy Spirit and men more with the operations of Christ. Now those are those are um, uh, those are interesting things to think about to help us to see how it's possible that men and women together minister, but with different ways of doing it. Just as the Holy Spirit and God the Son are the two arms of the Father working into the world. So. I, and, and this is what I was trying to get at when I was talking about Protestantism being masculinized. You take away all those rich stories where women uh, feature quite strongly. You take away especially the emphasis upon the Theotokos, Our Lady Holy Mary, and you end up with a church, um, a community that 
really only sees value in um, the way that men um, show forth Christ. At least that's the impression that you get. And it's more something that's an impression, the same as getting back to our translations, many of the early translations um, of the New Testament, the King James Version and the earliest NIV, avoid the use of the word tradition, um, except when it's being used negatively. And they thereby give an impression of tradition being something sub-Christian. I think by taking away the stories of women and um, and refusing to honor um, the Theotokos in the way that she had been honored through centuries, you give the impression that women are unimportant. And so there has to be a revolt, and there is a revolt in, in, in the Reformation because they know something's wrong. They just don't get the right answer. They end up throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Same thing with the use of the word tradition. If you don't ever see it being used in a positive way, such as Paul who says, you know, I, I praise God that you follow me in all the traditions, that you've received the traditions. Um, if you don't see uh, those that word being used positively, you're going to get the impression that tradition is deadly and not helpful and sub-Christian. And really, we need just the scriptures. So it's, it's yeah, all. I think, mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think um, that's something that you do such a masterful job of in the book as well. You show where the line is transgressed between translation and interpretation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, the quintessential example of that is the word tr tradition. When tradition is used in a negative sense, uh, the word tradition is used when it's uh, going to be used in a positive sense, the word teaching is used, but it's the same word, paradosis. Yeah, exactly. So it's the impression that's given. And, and, and there is this fine line between interpretation and tradition, or, or sorry, between interpretation and translation. There is a fine line. But if someone comes with a particular ax to grind or a particular view of something and is... Um, uncritical about their own um, presuppositions, they're much more likely to make an imposition upon scripture and to do what we call eisegesis, that is bringing to the text what they think it says, rather than an exegesis pulling out of the text what it says. And a good, a good interpretation really is an exegesis. You know, think back when the exiles come um, back to the Holy Land, and they some of them have don't have lost their Hebrew because they they've been abroad for for a generation, and so they read to them from the Torah, and the elders give the meaning. And that's not just a matter of reading it aloud in Hebrew. It's a matter also of translating it into the tongues that the people brought back with them from exile. Yeah, so why have so many Christians come to identify tradition as, as mainly oral in nature? I think that's the impression that's given when argument takes place about why tradition is important. So the example that I gave of uh, threefold immersion is something that we don't have written down um, except in canonical books, but they're not they're they're not accessible to everybody. So um, it's something that we say would have been passed out, uh, passed from leader to leader, from the apostles to their disciples, and through to the bishops, and so on, and that was continued in the church by word of mouth. So the examples that are often given are of oral things, but in fact, there are a lot of traditions that are written down. And that aren't just oral. And um, uh, the scripture itself contains many things that originally were oral. Um, and so there is, one cannot make uh, all of our hymns, for example, we would say in orthodoxy, our tradition and teach us that way. They teach us how to worship the troparia, the contakia, and so on, teach us about the mysteries of the incarnation and the mysteries of the resurrection and the mysteries of the nativity. Um, I actually was converted uh, through, through a, uh, through a uh, 
uh, a well-known hymn having to do with the presentation of the Lord Jesus at the temple. And it talks about Mary holding in her arms as tongs, uh, that hmm. living coal that Isaiah saw of old. And uh, I happened to be working on Isaiah at the time. And it just, I realized immediately, oh, she's not standing between me and Christ. She is offering me Christ. And it was... Hmm. It was an absolutely luminous moment that that and the penny dropped for the first time. So there are many things um, that are part of tradition that are not oral. But often when we try to explain the difference between tradition and scripture, um, we say, well, these are the things that weren't written down. But there are many of them that, that have been written down as well. Yeah. And scripture what? itself is made up of things that were originally oral. This is a bit of a personal question. I, I love the book of Revelation. I've spent many years memorizing the book of Revelation, and um, I'm in the process You're very of reading it. <laughs> well, but, well, the book of Revelation, actually, okay, so it's 404 verses, mm -hmm. so it's not hard to memorize. It's not that long. Uh, you think about the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount alone is 111 verses. But it's 404 verses, uh, 278 of them are direct allusions to Old Testament passages. So, for example, Revelation 17 is a virtual recapitulation of uh, Ezekiel 16. Yeah. Um, the, the, the book is, is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to a servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. So this is a revelation of Jesus Christ given to John. John is writing to seven churches in the epicenter of a Caesar cult. They're told to be faithful and fruitful. They're gonna suffer for a short time. Their vindication is gonna be a thousand years. If you know your Old Testament, you virtually know the book of Revelation. So I don't, I, I've never understood why, why oftentimes, even in Orthodox circles, this has seemed to be, well, too mystical or mysterious to even be used in literature. So I don't know what your reading habits are, but I, I am betting that you enjoy, um, stories, narrative, maybe some fantasy, poetry. Um, and I, I, I think the problem is that people think that they can approach the book of Revelation as though it were just the same kind of genre as the Gospels or just the same kind of genre as one of Paul's letters. Mm -hmm. And so they do very strange things with it, trying to decode it, trying to make timelines out of it, um, trying to add to the deposit of faith that we have already received mm -hmm. prior to the giving of that wonderful, encouraging word of John to the churches and to us. Oh, and by the way, just, just going back a little bit, there's a really good example um, in the book of Revelation of how oral and written come together because it's an apocalypse, which is from beginning to end, a written book. Uh, in apocalypses, people do things like swallow scrolls, right? So the writing is really important and they're told to write down, but it's also called a prophecy and there are all kinds of vibrant words in it. And so we have a coming together of the written and the oral in that book. So um, that that's really helpful too, but I would venture to say, and I think I think Michael Wilcock, who's written a really good commentary for the popular person on on the Book of Revelation, I would venture to say that he's right, where he says that there isn't a single new doctrine in the Book of Revelation. It's there to fill in and to color what we already have been taught. And people oh, that try to make of it special esoteric knowledge to add to what we already have that nobody else has and we're in the know are simply abusing the book. They're not understanding what its purpose is. And so I think that the church was very nervous because there were a group. There was a group back in the early church, the Montanists, who did this very thing and who thought that they had special information um, about um 
about hidden things, as did the Gnostics. And this book, if treated that way, can make a group that's inside and a group that's outside rather than enliven the entire uh, community as it was intended to do with the letters to the seven churches. That is so helpful. Um, you know, I, I thought as you're speaking about Matthew 24 as well, um, you know, the, the, this is the all of a discourse and, and Jesus just left the temple. He's walking away. His disciples call his attention to his buildings. He says, you see all these things. I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And then later the disciples find Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives and they talk to him privately and say, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age of sacrifice, essentially? Um, that passage, in that passage, you have Jesus saying, this generation will not disappear until all these things have been fulfilled. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. So you have critics of the New Testament, like Bart Ehrman, who say, well, you know, in that passage, uh, Jesus says, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. The heavenly bodies will be shaken. Well, that didn't happen. And Jesus said it would happen within a generation failing to recognize that Jesus is simply using the words of the Old Testament prophets. He's a far greater prophet than them all. He's using their words to describe the fall of Jerusalem. Um, the, the prophets would use that language. The sun has been darkened. The, the moon will not give us light. The stars will fall from the sky to describe events like the fall of Babylon in, I think, Isaiah 13. So, if you understand the Old Testament, then you have an understanding of what Jesus is doing. But if you don't understand the Old Testament, you don't. I think the same thing is true in terms of principle with respect to holy tradition. If you don't understand holy tradition, you're left in this, in this void that is filled with all kinds of bad interpretations and sensationalism. Yeah. And um, even though the book of Revelation is not typically read in Orthodox churches during worship, it is enacted. Mm. Our tradition is such that we have the incense, we have the Almighty um, there, we have the woman holding the child and presenting him to us. We have um, all the saints around, like the 24 elders, um, we, we have in our worship the tradition of the book of Revelation that then helps when somebody goes to actually read the book, that they understand this is about worship. This is about the victory of Christ. This is about saying, when you suffer, understand that you are doing that in solidarity with Christ and realize that this is a sign of victory, not of defeat. It gives a way of approaching the book of Revelation to be part of the holy tradition of the divine liturgy. Yeah, that is, uh, you have helped me a lot. I mean, I'm sure you're helping everybody else, but you've helped me a lot with uh, with your insights here. You know, you brought up Vladimir Lossky earlier on, and I, I, I can't believe he was a lay person. Maybe you know more about his history than I do, but I, 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 I in, 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 in making my transition into orthodoxy, Vladimir Lossky had such an impact on me. You quote him saying that the prophets and traditions show us the real meaning of the scriptures. The prophets and tradition show us the real meaning of tradition. I'll elaborate on that a little bit, just as um, a helpful summary of some of the things you were saying. So what comes before the New Testament? the prophets, and what comes after, although it's, it's, it's in continuity, but, but those traditions that come after the New Testament um, form a cushion around the one whom we worship. And one points forward to him, the others point back and illumine what it is that he said. And without the prophets, we um, we don't understand what it is that Christ is fulfilling. And without the traditions of the fathers who come after Christ, we can't understand fully what it is that he said and who it is that he was even. Um, so to give an example, 
Moses as a prophet stands, and he's one of the great prophets, right? Even though he's the lawgiver, he's also called the 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 the, the prophet. Um, stands at the he stands at the burning bush, and he hears the holy name, the existing one, the I am who I am, the I will be who I will be, the I cause to be what I cause to be. He hears this mysterious name of God as he receives his commission. That's a mysterious name that we don't come to understand until the Lord Jesus embodies the existing one and shows us who the father is and makes it possible for us to have the Holy Spirit in our midst. Um, and yet if we hadn't heard about Moses standing by the burning bush and receiving the oracles of God, we wouldn't have the joy of seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of that. And within the scriptures themselves, Paul understands that um, that word from Deuteronomy, a hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, as referring to the Father, God, and to the Son, the Lord, because he says, for us there is one God, from whom are all things, and for us there is um, one Lord Jesus Christ, for whom are all things. And yet this God is one. And then later he brings the Holy Spirit in in another part of, of, of one of the Corinthian books. Um, so we have a little bit of a glimmering with St. Paul. And there's some other passages too as to filling in what that identification of Jesus with the existing one, with the I am who I am means. But it's not until we get to the response of the later fathers in the second, third, and fourth century to those who didn't fully understand the mystery that we get this spelled out with care and even with some precision so that it was no longer possible after the fathers um, uh, framed the creed for a Christian to not believe that the Holy Spirit is a person. You could no longer be a Christian and think the Holy Spirit is just a force. You could not be a Christian and think that the uh, the Son was created. And they took from the scriptures those passages that um, that uh, illumined the the mystery of who it was, who Jesus is, who the Father is, and who the Holy Spirit is, and they put it in a brief synopsis so that we would understand it in the creed. So without the prophet, you wouldn't have the joy of recognizing Jesus as the fulfillment. But without the tradition of the fathers um, pushing against those who mistook who the Spirit was and who mistook who Jesus was, um, we would not have the wonder of. The, the 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 creedal declaration that we can make that we we worship the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and this is how this triune God has worked among us and continues to work among us. Eastern Orthodoxy is called the Church of the Seven Ecumenical Councils, certainly one way of describing Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, but talk about the ecumenical councils in terms of their significance with respect to holy tradition. And then as part of that, um, maybe you can discuss what is mutable and what is immutable with respect to the councils. Yes. So... I am not, I am not um, a specialist in canon law. Let me just begin with a uh, with a qualifier here, and so I'm going to speak more generally. But it seems um, that we can see a kind of uh, dynamic at work as we move from council to council, where those who gathered together were responding to particular problems in the church particular misunderstandings or debates within the church, and we're settling various things. Um, the most obvious, of course, is the um, uh, relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the deity of Christ and the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Um, 
those those ones we all recognize. And actually, I think it's quite interesting that that, that Protest, most Protestants would um, accept the Trinity as a tenet of faith, as I said before, but they really do need in order to make that a sure tenet of the New Testament in order to see how it is. But this dynamic that I'm speaking about is where something is decided, but then it takes, it's a, not until the next ecumenical council that it might be clarified and tweaked a little bit and ratified. And that leaves time between the councils for the bishops um, and, and those who are involved in the discussion to hear what the people are saying and to see whether this thing that they have decided has been received. And so um, there is there is a an important element um, of the councils which requires the reception of the, the of the decision by the church. Today's featured resource on the Hank Unplugged podcast is Scripture and Tradition, What the Bible Really Says by prominent New Testament scholar Edith M. Humphrey. To learn more about this resource, please hit the I in the upper right-hand corner. There are, along with the actual dogmatic statements that are made, the creeds and so on that are made um, at the various councils, there are also some canon laws that are um, uh that are appended to the various uh, the various declarations, and I think that that is where you were, are going to probably see um, instruction that is particular for a time, but which may, given um, uh, given changes in culture or changes um, in understanding, which may be modified. So, for example, most. I mean, it, it it's clear that in the New Testament period, um, the apostles, some of them were married. We hear a Peter's mother-in-law, for example, and Paul says, "Don't I have a right uh, uh, have a right to take a wife with me, like the other brothers do?" Later on, in the wisdom of the church, bishops were. Um, canon law was passed that said the bishop should be ascetic, should be monastic, should be celibate. And this probably was a response uh, to the fact that in those days, um, the dioceses were very large and they had to travel and it would be very difficult for them to manage well a household as well as managing the household of the church. But that looks as though a change has occurred. Um, Christians are in disagreement as to whether what looks like the very first council in, in Acts 15, whether its mandates are um, are permanently to be um, uh, to be accepted by all Christians today. But most particularly, my family's Scottish, so we had blood pudding on our table when when I was young, along with the uh, along with the potato scones, and and of course, blood pudding is what poor people would have had when they couldn't slaughter the cow, but they needed some protein, and they would bleed the cow, and then they would fry that. Um, strictly speaking, that's against Acts 15. But we have some uh, versions in which Acts 15 actually omits that particular requirement when it says the Gentiles will do well if they uh, if they live chaste lives, don't don't engage in in, in fornication and they that and they aren't idolaters and they abstain from blood. I mean, certainly in the first century, if Gentiles didn't abstain from blood, you could not have a table with a Jewish uh, uh, with Jewish believers and Gentile believers together because it would just be so offensive. So, but within that particular um, council, if you read Acts 15 carefully, you'll notice that the language is couched in, it seems best. It seems to us this is the best thing. It's given as guidelines rather than as this is the center of the faith to which you must always and for all time adhere. So we have a sense in Acts 15 that this was contingent for a particular situation. And I think that as you look at the various writings that are associated with the with the the, um, the councils down through the ages, some of those things are responding to vicissitudes. Uh, they're responding to particular situations at particular times that may not 
work uh, for us today or may not have worked in, 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 all, in all centuries. Uh, one of the, the hot button issues right now, actually, for Orthodox is how do you receive people who have named Christ in other um, in others uh, in other communities and they're coming to be Orthodox? Can you receive them if they've been baptized only by chrismation or should they be baptized? And that is something that's being discussed now at a time when um, other so-called Christian groups are no longer using the name, say, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Well, is this a baptism or isn't it a baptism? Right. Or what about if they haven't been immersed and so on? So there's there's some debate now going on um, among um, Orthodox with regards to the tradition that we received from early centuries, that when there was someone in a schismatic group, they did not have to be received by baptiz- baptism, but that they, they could be received by chrismation. So these are the kind of things that um, that careful discernment and Um, Leaders speaking together and pouring over the situations of the past and seeing whether they correspond to our situation today helps us to determine whether we're talking about holy tradition that never changes or traditions that are good for a time, but may may not always be um, useful in every situation. So how does the filioque factor into... (laughs) all of this. I mean, um, here you have a phrase that is added. You don't find it in the Bible. Um, and it, 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 it precipitates a break between East and West over a period of time, ultimately in 1054. But um, it, 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 it's always interesting to me that this is part of the, the ecumenical council. It's a canon and, and and now all of a sudden you have the sin of fratricide where you have a uh, a Western patriarch, uh, the patriarch of Rome, uh, pontificating. And as a result of that, you have a break in the church. So uh, this this seems to be on the side of immutability as opposed to something that can uh, t- t- take the form of mutability. Yeah. Yeah. Um- so there are some Orthodox who would disagree with me, who who would say that filioque could be within the realm of pious opinion if you mean a certain thing by it. Um, I don't follow that line myself. I think that just in terms of the way that the filioque came to be um, uh, imposed in the West, and um, it was attempted to impose it um, on other jurisdictions. Um, in it, that in itself is problematic. Um, we're talking about, uh, for those who aren't aware of the jargon, we're talking about in the creed whether we're saying that the Father, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, or from the Father and the Son. And to be fair. When the Western Church added the phrase, and the son, filioque, it was doing it for a good reason. (laughs) It was doing it because it wanted to say everything that the the father is, the son is. That the son is as honorable as the father. And when we look at the son, we see exactly the same, uh, we see an exact representation of who the father is. And so if the Holy Spirit proceeds, eternally from the Father, then the Holy Spirit has to proceed eternally from the Son. So that's the reason why it was added. The, the, the mistake, of course, is that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are each and all divine. They're each worthy of our of our um of, of our adoration and we're not we're not idolaters if we worship the son and the spirit along with the father in fact we would be idolaters if we didn't not worship the three and the one together but but we distinguish the father from the son because the son doesn't beget the father right we already have a distinction so um the, the the when the holy spirit is said to proceed from the father that is you have the father as the eternal source there never was a time when the son the spirit wasn't proceeding from the father just as there never was a time when the son was not begotten of the father there's always been that um 
that relationship between the three. With if you add and the sun, not the natural the natural inclination is to think of the Holy Spirit as an appendage, as here is one divine person who does who doesn't do what the other two do, and so he must be diminished in some way. And in fact, I think that when you look at spirituality in the West, in the West with the filioque, which which was added, you do get two things. You either get a um, a sidelining of the Holy Spirit who becomes very reserved and isn't understood well, or a kind of an eccentric, eccentric exaggeration of his role in some of the mystical writings. And this never was a problem for orthodoxy because the Holy Spirit was naturalized from the beginning and understood in his right relationship with Father and Son. Um, so for me, it's not just a matter of the Pope insisting um, that, um, say, Constantinople accept this and that being the cause of the rift, although that is problematic, um, and, and that something was added to a creed that should not have been added unilaterally. If it was going to be added, everybody would have had to agree uh, with the filioque, and of course that wasn't the case. That's part of it, but it's also that I think that in itself the teaching ends up sidelining or exaggerating the role of the Spirit one way or the other. And um, uh, it, it's for, uh, the way that I see it is this is a substantive problem, and I think that the creed as originally um, as originally framed, that, you know, he, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, but with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, that's immutable. It would seem to me that's holy tradition on the level of something that cannot be changed. Yeah, so you, um, one of the things I've said, um, correct me if, if if I'm wrong here, I, I think that the real problem in terms of the split between East and West becomes a sin of fratricide, uh, where you have, in essence, the Pope, and this would be a characterization, not mine, but um, where the, 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 the Pope or the Patriarch of Rome, the first among equals, um, becomes an imperious mistress of slaves as opposed to a pious mother of sons. Um, the church is supposed to work in collegial and conciliar fashion and uh, because the, the 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 patriarch of rome did not in this case you have the sin of fratricide fracturing the church yeah i mean i think i think that the 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 main sticking point between the east and west are the exaggerated claims of the papacy not the filioque although the filioque is part of that but but i mean i don't know um it, it may be not necessary to use language like fratricide in order to um, say there is a certain um, authority that the Patriarch of Rome traditionally had, but this was not a universal jurisdiction it was never intended for Peter to decide for everybody else um, uh, what should be, um, how worship should take place, what should be recited. This is something that the church together, that the that the patriarchs together would would work on and should work on. And I think you know maybe it's more just fear that you need to have a central authority figure where things are going to fall apart. You know, you, you remember, we're entering into dark the Dark Ages here and, and, and barbarians and the, the, the rise of Muslims and so on. And maybe it was the same sort of thing as what happened when the people went to Samuel and said, we need a king. <laughs> well, mm. maybe people wanted to have a strong jurisdictional leader who would act as as you use the, la the language, we would act imperially rather than in a nurturing way. And maybe it was lack of faith more than fat, uh, a, a, a desire to kill off the other, um, kill off the other patriarchs that, that motivated this. 
what, however it came to be, it certainly did change the nature of the church, which was to be collegial with all of the patriarchs working together and under them, all of the bishops working together and listening, by the way, to the lay people and to the, the, the prophets from the lay people below them as well. There's, you know, authority down, but there's also uh, there's also a feed, uh, an important dynamic of feeding up um, the response and the amen of the people. And I think having that kind of a dynamic makes some people very nervous and they'd much rather have a, a, a top down only line of command because you know where you stand. You, you don't leave things open. Yeah, your, your, your brilliant answer, I, I think, highlights the importance of understanding the historical milieu. Uh, when, when you do, it, 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 it opens up a broader understanding of what was going on and, and, and gives us far more insight holistically. I want to get back to what you said about celibacy in the priesthood, um, you know, w whether this is mutable or immutable, because, you know, if you look at the progression, as you point out, um, you can make the argument that the apostles had, had wives, certainly Peter, uh, that, that's, that's indisputable. Uh, you can also then go to the fourth century with St. John Chrysostom. St. John Chrysostom was arguing for uh, married bishops, mm -hmm. uh, not just married priests. Then you get to the sixth century, or, or I mean, you get to the sixth ecumenical council, and you have a canon that says that, that bishops uh, cannot uh, be married. Um, I, 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 laying that out, uh, in, in, in terms of the question, for me is important because I, I'm trying to get at, is, is this now mutable or immutable? Can circumstances change such that, uh, in, in concert with what you explained with respect to Acts chapter 15, uh, maybe you can have married bishops in, 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 if the church, the mind of the church points in that direction sometime in the future? Um, that's a tough one. Certainly there has been a change. Certainly there are principles with regards to the role of a bishop and his dedication to the people. Um, I, my, my instinctive response would be since it changed in one direction for a particular purpose, maybe it could change in another direction to meet, to match the problems of today. I'm a little loath, though, to jump too fast to that because we have such a exalted idea of marriage in this day. Well, oh, pardon me, of sexuality, sexual activity in this day, that I am afraid that the church is probably the only place where we have a witness remaining, that is the classical church, a witness remaining that says you can be a full-blown, well-adjusted, fruitful, helpful person and not in being being and not be intimate with someone else. Hmm. In other words, we've lost any instinctive idea that celibacy is a good when both Jesus and Paul told us that it was. And so I think we do need to have some formal patterns showing us um, people who have dedicated themselves only to God and are um, ascetic and uh, and um, happy to sacrifice that intimacy with another um, member of the opposite sex in order to witness to the fact that sexual activity is not the end all and the be all of life. So I can see both things going on in the same way as I could see, for example, um, a, uh, a good use for a return to the female diaconate. But I am very worried that because of the app, the attitude that people have today are returning. We do know there were deacons in the past. Again, our deaconesses in the past. I mean, again, uh, Chris Austin speaks about them, right? But I'm afraid that with given the climate 
of today, people will simply see this as a leg up to then include women in the priesthood and in the episcopate. So, you know, when we're talking about these things, we have to balance the pros and cons, and we have to be thinking about what, how, how would people respond, and what would we lose, not just what would we gain if we changed this idea, this idea that bishops should be single. Um, a celibate episcopate says something important about celibacy to us. On the other hand, maybe bishops would be more fatherly if they understood what their married clergy and married lay people had to go through. So I I, I can see it both ways. Wow, beautiful answer. Um, something really important you point to in your book, and there's, this book, by the way, let me say something before I ask the question, and that is to my audience, this book is really worth reading. As I said at the inter in the introduction, it's worth reading more than once. Scripture and Tradition, what the Bible really says by Edith Humphrey. It is available for anyone who stands shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. You can get your copy on the web at equip.org. You can write me at post office box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. Uh, you can also uh, simply dial triple eight ask Hank. Um, but anyway, the book is important and uh, you can get your copy again by standing shoulder to shoulder with us in the stand for truth in an age where it's important to stand for truth no matter the cost. Um, but, but, but to the question uh, uh, that you address in this book, uh, you, you, you talk about the Psalms and how the Psalms have, in essence, been neutered. A whole generation of Christians are now being raised in light of versions of the Psalms that have been uh, 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 neutralized for gender in modern translations. And th there's just a wonderful discussion of why you can't do that and the liabilities that are inherent in, in, in making that mistake, uh, including a misunderstanding of the imprecatory Psalms. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, this was a real eye opener. When I first, uh, the first time I ever went to an Orthodox church, it was Vespers, and they started to sing um, the amalgam of uh, Psalms 1, 2, and 3, as we always do, um, Blessed is the Man. And the priest went and stood in front of the icon of Christ. And that's the first time I ever realized that Psalm 1 speaks directly of Christ that he is the only man who doesn't walk in the way of uh, the wicked. He is the only man who flourishes entirely by the water. He is the true man and uh, the true human being. And I, I was just blown away because I had never thought about that before. And that opened my eyes to many of the other passages that either are, are speaking in the voice of Christ or are fulfilled by Christ. And actually, uh, a book that's very helpful in um, in uh, showing that in an easy way would be the book by Patrick Reardon, Christ in the Psalms, which is a wonderful collection, just very short readings. You could do one once a day, but to show how Christ is in the Psalms in one way or another. And that is lost if we take if we take away um, the gendered language in the Psalms. Of course, that Psalm 1 speaks about women as well as men. We need to be planted by the streams of water, but we, we only can be that if we are in Christ, and it speaks specifically of the one who is the true human being, the true man. Yeah, beautiful. Um, we, we've talked about this in the duration of this podcast, but 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 just so that we're really clear about the distinction between a holy tradition or tradition with a capital T and tradition with a small t. Right. So, I mean, there are traditions that uh, come into every worshiping body um, that are there for a specific purpose and that and that meet a specific need. Right. But then there is holy tradition that continues, that is immutable, that will not change, and that is part of the lifeblood of the church and um, and and uh, is the way that the Holy Spirit directs the church to live, 
how the Holy Spirit directs us to read the scriptures and to understand them. Um, and uh, it, the, the problem with using the word I'm a traditional Christian is that people often think, well, that means that you insist on using the these and thous um, in, when you're singing uh, the, the troparian or the cantakia, that, 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 um, that you have a, a, a particular um, uh, like for Byzantine chant or uh, for for if you're in the Russian tradition for a Slavonic version of 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 the um, uh, of the um, of the hymns, or if you're outside of Orthodoxy, that you're you're cleaving to the old hymns for their own sake, um, and that's that's the distinction you made at the beginning, Hank, between tradition and traditionalism. Well, I I, I think that um, if we hold too tightly to those small t traditions that were there for a particular purpose, but whose purpose has already been met and passed, uh, then we're mistaking what this is about. But there are, in fact, those things that are given to us, to the church, to always hold on to and to conserve. And that's what holy tradition involves. And that we see holy tradition in, in our creeds. We see holy tradition in the scriptures. We see holy tradition in how we order our lives together in the large um, in, in the large way. We see it in the feasts of the church. Those are all things that are enlivening to us and that are part of who we are. Something else I wanted to ask you about just occurs to me, uh, the name of the triune God, Father, Son, mm -hmm. and Holy Spirit, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal. Um, for the purposes of inclusivity, can you change that to mother, child, womb, or oh, any other variation that's, that's so popular today? That's, that's, such, that's such a large topic, but a uh, short answer, no. Jesus hmm. did not give us the Our Mother. Jesus gave us the Our Father. And to say that we can change that is to assume that we have more understanding than he did. Um, to say that, you know, there's even, oh my goodness, there's even a, a hymn in the newest Anglican hymnal that has a very variants for various um, saints days and the, the saint day for Saint Joseph. Uh, the foster father of Jesus says something like, "All praise to you, O God, for Joseph, the father of our Lord." And it goes on to say how um, he taught him carpentry and, and and was kind to him and so on. And then the last line is, "And Joseph's love made father to be for Christ God's name." Now just parse that out. That's suggesting Jesus called God Father because as a young boy, he had a wonderful father figure. It does the psychology of Jesus. Hmm. It doesn't it it, it 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 neutralizes the pattern that we're given in the our father who art in heaven, suggesting that, well, maybe if Jesus had had not a good father, he might have said our mother who is in heaven, right? Um, there, I've written on this extensively, and it's quite a problematic, um, uh, quite a problematic thing in the churches today. But um, there is something built into the Christian story and into the view of reality that it gives that requires fatherhood. Motherhood is also important, but to suggest that those are interchangeable is to miss the whole point. Christ, for example, is the bridegroom of the church, and the church is the bride. You cannot reverse those things, or if you get rid of the language, you flatten something that is a mystery. And these aren't just metaphors. They are metaphors that are iconic or pointing to something that we can hardly imagine. If we dump the language, we're missing something about the mysterious reality in which we live, in my view. Yes, um, I, I, I want to sort of conclude the podcast with a quote from Bradley Nassif, uh, a, a friend and someone that I I admire greatly. Um, you quote him in the book, uh, saying the the great tradition then encompasses not simply the transmission of the gospel in narrative form and doctrine in terms of creedal propositions, but also a common approach to morals, life habits, 
and shared worship that connects Christians together across time and centuries. That's right. It's it's the life it's the life of the church, and we're dependent upon other people, just as some people are dependent upon us. And one of the one of the chapters in uh, scripture and tradition, tradition, I talk about the importance of our mediating for one another and our receiving, um, our receiving the mediation of others. Uh, tradition is something that we've received. Um, and yet it brings us face to face with the God who is immediate, who can speak to each one of us um, directly. And there, there's something we always think uh, in the 20th century because of our, our allergy to, to these things. We think, oh, tradition has to be uh, something that's uh, set in stone that 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 is deadening that is um enslaving instead it's something that brings us close to each other and brings us directly with god and i actually expanded that chapter on mediation the immediate god for my in my my latest um publication um and had a, had 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 a wonderful time thinking about that paradox that we're dependent upon others even while god is there directly for each one of us but tradition Whenever is an I'm- example of that Whenever I meet someone like you, I wonder where you've been all my life. I, I, <laughs> you're just so enriching in in not only your writing, but your communication is so clear and poignant and profound. I'm I'm deeply grateful for you and for the gifts God has bestowed upon you. Thank you. It's it's been a real pleasure to be here, and we we are very. Um, everyone is very enthusiastic about your ministry and and your um, your being a, a, among us. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Edith. Um, again, the book, please get a copy and, and, and don't just put it on the bookshelf, read it. Um, this, this will deepen your faith. It'll deepen your trust in the church, um, the mind of the church. You'll start to understand the mind of the church and the importance of that phrase. Scripture and tradition. This is a sticking point for so many people. Scripture and Tradition, the title, what the Bible really says. Again, available for anyone who stands shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. I do want to end the podcast by saying, please subscribe, rate, review. It it, it does make a world of difference. And and, and just read one short quote by someone that uh, gave us a five-star rating for the Hank Unplugged podcast. His name is Danny. I won't read the whole uh, thing, just a couple of lines. I tried to rank higher than five stars. This is not because of me, by the way. This is because of the guests I have. They are interesting, informative, inspirational. Says, I love your Hank Unplugged podcast. Thanks for all the great Bible Answer Man broadcasts, the journal, and now Hank Unplugged. I'm 71 years old. That's pretty young for me because I'm 73. And for many, many years now, you have pointed me in the direction of numerous great roads at the end of which I have found true treasures in Christ. Thank you, my brother. Blessings, Danny. And and this is something I say over and over again. I mean, we're talking about treasures. I have... N- I feel like I'm enveloped in orthodoxy in a treasure chest that I can't get to the bottom of. And and I think our guest today, Edith, has has demonstrated that in spades. So, Edith, again, thank you from the bottom of my heart for your writing, for your perceptive, uh, very clear answers. Uh, I I could talk to you for uh, for for days on end and never get tired of it. Well, I hope we have an opportunity to do that when we're not recording and we can just uh, <laughs> just enjoy each other's company. Well, maybe, maybe we'll have an opportunity to do that. Again, thank you so much, Edith. You have been a delight. And uh, yeah, just a, a, a rich table of spiritual food. Thank you so much. And with that, Very we'll well. conclude this edition of the Hank of Plug podcast. Thanks for, for tuning in. I look forward to see you next time with another episode of Hank Unplugged. So long for now. Today's featured resource on the Hank Unplugged podcast is Scripture and Tradition, What the Bible Really Says, by prominent New Testament scholar Edith M. Humphrey. To learn more about this resource, please hit the I in the upper right-hand corner.